So yeah. from the shoreline at Bambuk, it's a pseudonym for the town where I did my field work. Near the beach where the Lao boats dropped off customers for the weekly market, I sat with Le, a Thai Lao fisherman from the village, and watched a long line of foam go past. What was it? Was it agricultural runoff? Some kind of byproduct from an industrial machine somebody in the village had purchased? Maybe it was organic froth from a fish pond that maybe breached into the water. Neither Le nor I knew what it was. Nor did anyone learn call to ask, although the line of foam seemed to stretch the entire length of the village and we couldn't find its source. For Le, it became a symbol of the new order on the river. It was a sign of something larger. Water levels on the Mekong, once seasonal, could now alter a meter in a night. Some fish species had entirely vanished from the river. Strange boats from the Thai or Lao side, everyone had an opinion, but nobody really cared to volunteer. Prowl the water armed with electric batteries and fish shocking equipments or bombs. From the smallest level at the minutest detail, the Mekong was changing. Lert observed these changes with dread, others with anger, and still others with the giddy abandon of a prospector in a gold rush. But change has come and is continuing to come fast and at multiple scales. The consequences of these projects, these changes for the river and the people who depend upon it, are multiple from salt encroachment on the delta, to the alteration of traditional fishing practices, to fish migration. These are changes that have come with various elements of the Belt and Road Initiative, upstream dams, rapid, uh, the blasting of midstream rapids and the like. But the question I really wanna get at today is this, what makes up a world? Can we speak of one shared world with multiple takes upon it? Or are there entirely different worlds, different configurations of what exists what has power, what is possible? The answer here for those of us embedded in modernity seems self-evident. Of course, there is a world that we share and there are correct and incorrect, but maybe harmless, but charming takes upon it. If we speak, for instance, of earthquakes caused by the movements of subterranean serpents, the Southeast Asian Naga, rather than plate tectonics, what then? Are these for moderns, these might be cultural or religious explanation of an actual tectonic feature. Maybe they're relevant for, for preserving happiness or community buy-in or some abstraction like culture. At worst, maybe they're barriers to, to forward movement of development, barriers to knowledge and education. But as an anthropologist, I have to ask what happens if we take these other worlds seriously? Is there a way to reconcile a world that is infused with agency and magic and the modern world. In a place that I'll talk about today, where Naga are a feature of religious veneration as well as a figure to whom families trace their ancestry, the workings of the earth are embedded with relationships of care that exceed the everyday. I apologize here, the lights may flicker on and off, the power supply here is intermittent. Uh, the internet, however, moves forward. Taking other worlds seriously is a question that's been taken up by the so-called ontological turn within anthropology, a movement that peaked perhaps a decade ago and involved thinking through the ramifications of this, taking worlds as they're presented to us rather than as misinterpretations or mystifications of, of other forces. As an example of one of those mystifications, I'll cite one of my favorite books actually, Michael Tausig's famous account of Bolivian miners and Colombian sugarcane uh, cutters. In his stories, Diabolical figures offered a moral compromise, get rich, but have any money gained lead in the long term to ruin. For Tausig, this was an evocative way to talk about the moral compromises involved in engaging in the extractive, exploitative economy of the region, one with its roots deep in the history of slavery. But here, what occurs to me now is how the world as lived by Tausig's interlocutors fades into the background to be replaced by what Tausig already knew, the alienation of labor. We don't need devils to arrive here, just a clear-eyed understanding of Marxist economics. Devils are, in other words, a metaphor, albeit an unwitting one. We see similar takes in the assumption of curses directed towards hydropower projects by uh, spirit mediums and protesters as really, in quotes, artistic forms of protest, or perhaps the development of community, the building of community solidarity, or perhaps something generalizable as religion. We do not see them often in the same way 
that, that, that those who venerate Nagas do. In contrast, an ontological assumption asks us to take these cosmopolitical claims at face value. In the Andes, for instance, Marisol de la Cadena, Mario Blazer described the workings of the Tiracuna, the sentient powers of the mountains, as speaking to an alternate way of living with the world as opposed to one based around extraction. An ecological sensibility revolving around caring for mountains, not simply as repositories of value, but as beings for whom one bears responsibility. How does that change our approach to them, to mining, to claims of ownership over rather than partnership with the land? It's this question, how to live in partnership with a river that I want to talk about today. Tiaba, do you really believe this? Is a question I'm often asked by individuals both in the field and outside the field. And in fact, in Thailand, this is the question that I'm asked the most in my research on spirits and possession and ghosts. Are Nagas real? Uh, if they are, then science has kind of validated the actual existence of, of, of Nagas. Or is this an assumption behind many asking me this, or this is an assumption, am I really a fool for believing superstitious villagers? If Nagas are not real, then a campaign of re-education is in order. But when I'm asked this question by somewhat by uh, those involved in Naga veneration, my, my interlocutors, my, the fishermen that I, with whom I work, um, pseudonyms that I have here, Le Ramon, or another fisherman with, with whom I lived um, with my field research for about two years between 2014 and 2019, another perspective is revealed. Question, are we doing the right thing? Something vital has changed in the land. How do we reach it? It is not really a question that research interlocutors of an ontological anthropology are supposed to ask. For Martin Holbrad, De La Cadena, and others, the only way to explain it is a kind of a loss of an alternate world, a loss of faith. Like the culture concept of previous years, a loss of belief in one's own way of life marks not a real question, but a statement of crisis. Perhaps one should find another interlocutor. It is what is revealed in this question, do you believe, that I want to take seriously here. How does such a question reveal the shakings of the foundations of the earth or of the river, and what do they have to say about the state of the Mekong today and the effects of, the, of infrastructure upon it? What, too, can this tell us about time? The Mekong has long been seen as a pipeline linking China to Southeast Asia. Seen here is the relevant word. It has yet to become such a thing. While French efforts to seize territory in Vietnam, the creation of French Indochina, the era of colonialism there, were done with the thought that the Mekong could prove just such a highway, a trade route into the Chinese heartlands, this ambition, these ambitions were stopped as soon as the French reached the Khon Falls on the Lao-Cambodian border. The Mekong as a navigable corridor would never come to pass so long as those falls stood. In the years since, the river has become uh, has been the site of conflict more than development. Thai Lao competition over the region, the relative inattention paid by the French to the river once its potential proved illusory, and the century of Cold War conflict on the river meant that powers in the region had greater worries than the flow of the river. But in the years since, China has seen its presence increase in the region that, and the development of Yunnan province, the Mekong is gaining new prominence. While the Khon Falls are still there and still a formidable barrier to anyone going between the Lao section of the river to the Cambodian and out to the sea section, development firms have undertaken to the blasting of smaller rapids along the river's course upstream in between Yunnan and, um, and Vientiane, opening up a channel from Yunnan to Laos and then working in tandem with new rail lines uh, down to Thailand, Malaysia, the port of Singapore. Further, the scale of flow on the river offers potential for hydropower projects, of which there are now 86 on the river as a whole, in between all the countries involved here. Significantly, the Don Sahong and Sayaburi dams already generate massive amounts of electricity largely sold to Thailand, and the proposed Sanakam Dam north of Vientiane would be another massive investment in Laos. These are in addition to the dams already across the mainstream in China, just north of where it crosses into Southeast Asia. Construction on these has accelerated in recent years, with the first efforts in Banbuk, at least in my field site, at least, really noticeable 
in 2003, after the Jinghong hydroelectric project began operation, and especially within the last five years or so after the Saiburi Dam project in Laos began. These dams, this is Jinghong, by the way, Tianrong in Thai. These dams do a number of things on the river, things that are not captured by environmental impact assessments, at least as they are done by development agencies there. These are things that I like to think about via flow and time. For one, as Ming Li Yong elsewhere points out, they selectively block certain flows and enable others. Electricity flows now because of the dams, feeding shopping malls and air conditioners of Bangkok and Kunming. They also arrest the motion of silt down the river, leading to erosion um, all the way down to the delta. This has had the surprising effect of turning the red-brown Mekong blue and clear. This is a boon for tourists, maybe, but less beneficial to the ecology of the seasonal river. In some parts, this clear water leads to the blooms in algae, Tao in Lao. Freshwater algae, which in the right places and time can be eaten as part of local cuisine, but in too great quantities destroys nets laid out across the river. It also spells chaos for fish ecosystems already arrested by the already disrupted by the arresting of another flow, which is, of course, the migration of fish. While some dams, as Ian Barrett has shown, have measures allowing for fish to move seasonally, at others, even fish ladders installed are designed for other species, not the slower moving murky water Mekong fish. They don't exactly leap up out of the water like a salmon would. Time, in other words, as Hamlet would have said, it is out of joint. The flow of water from the dam is sporadic. Dry season floods and ebbs are a new feature of the river. The water can spike without rain in the middle of the dry season. With these spikes catching riverbank farmers off guard and strangling plants that have adapted to a semi-aquatic cycle with periods of time submerged, so that fish may eat and distribute seeds in periods of time exposed so that they can bear leaves and photosynthesize. This image here is in the background, so you can't, it's a little dark, but you can clearly see the water line from a dry season flood. And if you look carefully, uh, you can see there are some plants there that have had everything below a certain level destroyed of leaves and just a small green line at the top. These rapid fluctuations done to meet power demands have no room for slow biological time. Biology requires slow changes in an organism from growing leaves from budding leaves from, and growing fruit to growing and laying eggs for fish. It is not a rhythm that syncs well with electricity consumption. So let's imagine the perspective of a fish for a moment. When that flood comes in, there's an expansion of the river world and a contraction of the land. From the perspective of the fish in a nine meter pulse, new realms open up. Former farmland becomes inundated and becomes perfect ground for browsing anything left uh, to be submerged. Streams are navigable by large fish now and good places to lay eggs because when the water recedes, they'll provide suitable environments for fingerlings. But of course, Ecological time as well is out of joint. Those floods, new floods come when eggs are not ready. The yearly pulse is not nearly the size that it should be many years. Think for a moment on time in these worlds. Oh, um, let's go. It also does not make room for religious time. During the dry season, villages on the Thai and Lao banks gather together to make temporary zones on sandy islands that emerged from the river to celebrate the Buddhist New Year, which has just passed us. In 2004, an unauthorized and an unannounced discharge from the Jinghong Dam wiped out one of these villages, costing tens of thousands of baht worth of damage. But this is not just a party. These festivals organize time, organize other activities within the village, marking points in the calendar where certain kinds of fishing take place. If one wants to catch this kind of a fish, one should put these kinds of nets out in between these two holidays. Periods of time with active fishing, active donations at spirit temples, or spirit shrines and temples, followed by relatively fallow periods. All of these schedules are thrown into disruption. Buddhist time comes out of joint. There's also economic time here too. 
Not only is the ebb and flow of the dam river altered by power demands in Bangkok and, and elsewhere, but migration cycles are another effect of the dams. This is migration cycles of people, not just fish. Above a certain income level, most residents between their late teens and early 40s spent some years abroad working, many in Bangkok or other Thai cities, but many too in international migrant labor, both on and off the books. Electronics factories in Taiwan, construction sites in Bangkok, vineyards in Israel, spas in Dubai, container ships in the open seas, not to mention marriage migrants to Malaysia, South Korea, and Sweden, were all a feature of the lives of just four or five out of the households in my study. Of the six siblings in the family where I, uh, with whom I lived during my research, only three, and one of these had severe uh, disabilities, had not worked elsewhere for a significant period of time. And as fishing becomes less and less lucrative, uh, fishermen that I surveyed estimated their yields were down to about 30%, so a drop of about 70% of what they were in normal years. The town then comes to rely upon this flow of money from these absent but present members. For those in Thailand, this took for the form, for those working you know, in Bangkok or elsewhere, this took the form of a yearly return of the Buddhist New Year at a time when migrants made a show of dropping up their earnings in the form of consumer or luxury goods, goods that I know very well from my field work with them in Bangkok, they could not afford. For others, this was a cycle of yearly remittances sent by wire transfer. Here then is a new regime of time, a time spent around migration and waiting, a time dependent on spectral presences whose labor, whose inputs still fuel the life of the town. There's other economic rhythms too. Crop prices fluctuate without discernible rhythm. Many of my interlocutors took their money from migrant labor and invested it in rubber plantations at a price where a time when prices were high, um, use it or use these, this income to fuel restaurants, uh, uh, over cross-border uh, manufacturing, these sorts of things. But naturally, as everybody invests in rubber around the region, prices crashed out, and what is left now is another period of waiting, another cycle of dependence upon something else, now that the river and the crops are unreliable. So let's go back to the question. Do you believe in this? It's a strange question when posed to me by Mon, a uh, fisherman with whom I lived, who had just then taken me through his elaborate schematic of how nagas and fish coexisted on the river. Mon had drawn scales, drawn uh, schematics for me of how the great serpents burrowed underneath the ground and made subterranean tunnels underneath the riverside hills for large fish to hide in away from fishermen's nets during periods of low water. These were, as, as he said, sort of pipelines that they could bypass nets, electricity traps, bombs, poison, a transit from the daylit world through Nagalo, the subterranean realm of the non-human. Non it's a cooperation, in a sense, between the sometimes human, sometimes other supernatural inhabitants of the river in favor of its biota, it's an alliance against the human, on the part of animals and spirits. Mon gave offerings at a shrine to Naga elders at two points in the river. And this is sort of the, the riverbanks Mon is talking about. And I chose this picture here because as you can see, things are changing. There's fortification here by concrete because of the erosion that has happened in recent years because of the irregular flow and the lack of silt. Mon gave offerings at a shrine to Naga elders at two points in the river. One is this, a sort of a deep pool known to be a prime location for catching babu, the Mekong giant catfish. And at another place, at a treacherous bend in the road known for car accidents. Climbing a hill where he had promised to show me an entrance to one of his tunnels, he stopped and pointed out a long sinuous track moving towards us from the Laotian bank of the river. As we watched this disturbance of the water approach, Mon and his brother wondered aloud if it was a Naga coming to investigate what we were doing so close to its projects. But as it turned out, it was a python, a creature that for many urban dwellers is acquainted with the, the mythological serpent, but to, but to which after we had identified it as a python, Mon paid very little attention. Mon claimed to have seen both py pythons and Nagas quite frequently. And unlike the devotees who flocked to Naga shrines near, nearby Kamchanoa forest, clearly differentiated the two. 
So why does Mon ask me if, if I believe, if he is so invested in the Riverian cult of the Naga, if he has established a schematic for the Naga's world and claims that this schematic is what will save fish on the Mekong, he's taken me through a religiously inspired means of hope for the river and then asks me to cast doubt upon it. Why does, I argue, he asks himself the same question. And what does this question really mean? So the word tia, right, tia in, in Lao, the, the word of belief is a difficult one in, top, in popular Thai religious practice. This is sort of, sort of an ordinary word. It's not the word for faith or something like that. It's not, in, it, it's not uh, embedded with that religious uh, notion of reverence, tawai, these kinds of other terms that me have very deep religious meaning. One can revere but not believe, as a popular saying goes, I don't believe in the spirits, but neither do I offend them. It's a way of being that asks for practice and decorum, not necessarily a profession of an inner state, which is exactly what Mon is asking me. As anthropologists of magic and popular religion are keen to point out, positing the question of belief at the core of religion saying religion is founded upon belief is itself a modernist take. As religions moved out of the public sphere into the private, and as Abrahamic religions, especially Protestantism, become the supposed universal template for religion, practices that did not rely upon professions of faith were ultimately placed with, within the category of magic or animism. Doubt here is kind of left out. In a new volume, Peter Jackson describes this movement of modernity into the Thai religious sphere. For Jackson, Thailand's encounter with moderns has led to a split in popular practice, a purification of Thai Buddhism on one hand and the growth of magical practices on the other, a split that gives rise to the often vitriotic, vitriolic repudiation of village belief by advocates for a secularized, rationalized Buddhism. But this remainder, this excess, leads to the enchantment of the Thai economy for Jackson. Noting some of the same parallels as Taussig, or in, in Jackson's preferred citation, the Komarovs, uh, noted between the occult workings of enchantment and the occult workings of the market, Jackson makes the opposite argument. It's not that Thai magical practices follows the logic of the market, but rather that the market becomes an enchanted sphere. Investments in magical monks, amulets, and other sources of potency become ways through which wealthy Thais can access new spheres of religious life, explaining the efflorescence of Thai magical practices during the kingdom's period of economic growth. I should point out, also uh, speaking to a Hong Kong audience, that there is a massive market for Thai amulets and the, exactly what Peter Jackson is talking about in Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and kind of elsewhere. This is for Jackson not the opiate of the masses or some kind of alleviation of anxiety, as I've argued, um, surrounding economic precarity, but rather a common field of signification. A person of influence uses this influence both in the economic realm as well as in the supernatural realm. But Jackson's work is on the Bangkokian elite. The sources that he cites as examples of these kinds of practices have only minor relevance in Bamboo. The name of the reformist monk Buddhadasa is unfamiliar in the village. The ascetic Santiaso community, known mostly for their as in the village, known mostly for their opposition to Taksin Shinawata, kind of a popular political figure. Similarly, this monk here, Long Pao Hun, is famous nearly everywhere in Thailand. But at the same time, cults of Chulalongkorn and Rama V, the what uh, a a former monarch who is embedded with kind of a, as a tutelary deity these days, is largely a Bangkokian middle-class ethnic Chinese Sinotai practice. Bangkok is, as Mon put it to me, a long way away. But here I wanna build upon Jackson's observations about the extension of religious logic into other spheres. Indeed, Jackson critiques the two neat categories of religion and magic as two separate realms as they apply to Thailand. I wanna go further. My point is that as time on the river changes, as the nature of what exists it changes, its ontology in the philosophical rather than the, than the anthropological sense, as that changes, it raises the question of potency. By potency here, I mean the assurance that efforts will bear fruit, that one can adapt to the changes and shocks in the world, the ability to cause crops to flourish, prices to improve, 
the river to remain stable, fish to appear, families to prosper, the ability, in other words, to become. So I believe. There's another element to the question. Elsewhere, I've written about the kind of public repudiation of a spirit medium who had kind of demurred when asked by, uh, by the fishermen to stop the Mekong dams. The spirit pressured sort of responded by saying he could put a small hole in the dam to help out the fishermen. And this reply was resoundingly mocked by the, the men assembled. The spirit then just retorted that the Laotian spirits had said that this dam was, was needed for national development. Laos needed development just as much as Thailand did. And what was a Thai spirit to deny Laotian spirits their development? Angry fishermen towards the back of the crowd nudged me, asking me the same question, albeit with a different inflection. Do you believe this nonsense? Isn't she just a crazy old lady? In the spirit's admission of powerlessness, it abdicated its authority, its very existence. The river lord had become a crazy old lady. I should note the term lord here is, is significant. The same word for possessing spirits, king, and owner, Tao, is all the same thing. They kind of, the river uh, spirits here are the owners of the river, much as I am the owner of this computer, or um, the monarchy is the owner of the land in which it, 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 it governs. Other mediums elsewhere promise the mobilization of Ruparian lords in the defense of the river. In Tabo, near Nolhai city, a gathering of Naga and other river mediums sent curses upstream towards the dam, dysentery, ruin, bad luck. A cluster of brightly clad women and men, often uh, at, at times gay men or uh, uh, trans women, each attempting their own method for sending ruin upstream. But this, these two crowds were not the same. These were urban mediums. These were, they were working in tandem with a tabal based NGO. The script here had already been set. This was, as with De La Cadena's Andean examples, uh, an internet connected, mobilized and organized protest. It was a sign of opposition rather than a quest for potency. This is not to critique such magical religious registers of protest as somehow inauthentic, uh, simply as aspects of Jackson's modernity. They're on one side of the split. Justice denied in the temporal realm is offered an appeal, excuse me, is offered an appeal that transcended. But these protests do not have Mon's doubt within them. None of, in, uh, none of this idea of the changed world. In the case of protest, whether or not we believe in the power of the medium is not really an issue. And as, as I've written elsewhere, we are not asked, nor, or rather, we're able to partially believe or, or to believe this one and not that one. It doesn't matter in the same way that it does to Mon. In other words, the righteousness of the cause is not in doubt, and nobody expects the Naga to emerge from the water and smash the dams wide open. Returning to Mon here, when I say exactly what I should say in these cases, when I say what I've been scripted to say, which is exactly, I do not believe, but I do not offend. Mon gets angry with me. I'm going to phrase it a bit more politely than he phrased it to me. I ask you a real question. You've been more places than I have. You're a doctor. Do you believe? Are they real? The stakes are high. Is he doing the right thing? What works? How can we stop the dams? Take Mon's perspective for a moment. The world has fallen apart. Time has come out of joint. The spirits of the river are its owners. Indeed, this is the meaning of Tao. Ownership, lordship. They govern what works, how prosperity and potency come to exist upon the river, when the river is kind, when it is cruel. Take the rapid just outside of Mon's home, Gangpan, the cruel rapid, its name means. For Mon and other pious fishermen, moving up and down the, the treacherous stretch is tense. But in everyday occurrence, one has a relationship with the rapid. For those ignorant of the river's capability, for those that the rapid does not know, it is dangerous. For instance, it tore the bottom out of a Chinese cargo vessel some years ago, spilling cargo and oil into the river. A story of a lack of knowledge about the, the rapids, of course, but also an inattention to coexistence, a lack of recognition on either side, a lack of recognition by the by the ship's pilot towards the, the owner of the rapid, towards the spirit, and a lack of recognition by the owner of the rapid towards the ship. 
But the ability of the river lords to manage their hydroscape has waned as the rise and the fall of the Mekong suggests, as the powerlessness of this one medium suggests as well. New owners may have come, or no owner at all. How else to explain the, the dry season pulses or the medium's declaration that the Lao River Lord now holds sway over the cycles of water flowing past the Thai village? This could be the working of that Lord, the working of all two human Lords, Tao, of course, uh, in the Jing Hong control station, but it represents a crisis of mastery, a crisis of potency, a crisis of ownership upon the river. I might rephrase Mon's question then as, who rules the river now? How do I contact who rules the river? How do I show myself to them? How do I return time to something predictable? It is a vital question for a fisherman. Let's take that question seriously then. Let's take that doubt seriously. Who rules? To answer this, we have to turn towards other lords, towards other masters. There's another kind of time present on the river, different from the cyclical time present in the ecological rhythms or hydrological pulses, a time that promises the present as a brief moment of disruption between cycles of prosperity, a linear time, the time of progress. These two regimes of time clash here. They, they clash together because of the alteration of the order of things. With hydropower, with the blasting of rapids, we see a new ontological reality, a new nature culture on the river, in other words, a new regime of time. For about 100 years, since the reign of Brahma V in the late 1800s, through the military regime of the People Administration in the 1920s, modernization has been the purview of the Thai elite. I think it's significant that the word culture, as a, a neologism in, in, uh, in Thailand for about 100 years ago, Watanatam, has its root not in anything that grows up from the ground, as it does in, in, in English, but in progress, in Watanatam. Maurizio Pileggi writes about how the Thai elites positioned themselves as the arbiters of foreign technology and culture, and in so positioning, they placed this influence as always already Thai. Michael Hertzfeld dubs this process crypto-colonialism, where ontological worlds, my term, not his, from outside are cast as the inevitable destination of the nation. People in era propaganda made a show of declaring Western dress, for instance, as proper Thai culture, because it led to a social order and an aura of respectability fixated in the future, not in the past or in the present. In this way, linear time is changed. Time of progress is changed. The past will not be the same as the future. And what is the, and it is the role of fishermen, such as Mon, to adapt. So what is new is not this linear time. What is new is the disruption is the, the clash of regimes that now that notion of progress, these interventions are altering the very way cycles in the world works. This is something we don't need dams in the river to talk about, especially in the case of climate and, and other kinds of, 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 of systems too. So let's move into analyzing this idea of time. In a promotional video by CK Power, the company responsible for managing the outflow of electricity from Sayabari, we have a cartoon young Thai boy wandering through a rice field at night in the dark. He finds a little toy helicopter. He spins it, and it flies into a temple fair brightly lit by electric light. The helicopter continues into a tent labeled in Thai, CK Power, where we see the boy seeing the rest of the promotional video. Over images of the Thai countryside, the voiceover announces that Saiburi and other projects will bring, as they say, endless happiness and a pleasant environment. For those impacted, and it should be mentioned, those impacted are those that impact assessments determine are impacted. The village of Banbuk is not on any environmental impact assessment. Um, these videos often leave out the downstream and more systematic impacts that this paper, uh, sorry, the, CK Power promises for those impacted occupational improvement plans and uplifting villagers' livelihood in a sustainable manner. It is pretty standard corporate fare. Images of rural villages, as we see above in this first image, are interspersed with shots of underdeveloped rural life. A shirtless man in this image saws a board with a handsaw. Farmers wear the iconic Southeast Asian straw hats, which is still popular in Bad Book, although most of my interlocutors like American-style cowboy hats. 
Villages cling to the side of green mountains, but the closing image of, of a well-dressed child in school implies that the future is going to be very different. It speaks towards the upwards trajectory of developmental time. The boy will not be his father. He will not be voiceless, but will instead be an agent for and not a subject of development. Indeed, this division between active agents and passive subjects is repeated in the videos. Partnership comes with images like that on the bottom. Is reserved for shareholders. The bucolic scenes are intercut with cold engineering as a boardroom scenes with these lovely arrows going up and without necessarily a, a reference. With foreign, that is to say, whites or East Asian faces interspersed with Southeast Asian ones. It is a video too that recalls other promotional videos for the Thai monarchy, such as the royal anthem for King Pumipon, played before every film during the latter years of his reign. These exemplified electrification and the process of rural developments. Speaking of which, rain droplets collect on the camera lens as we move over a verdant jungle and the first strains of the an anthem in Raksa language, a, a, a royal language unintelligible to most Thais, plays out. Bare electric bulbs light up to the delight and wonder of villagers. The irony here of villagers astounded by a light bulb seems to be lost on the, on the director um, any of my interlocutors who had spent long years of time in Taiwan and in Seoul um, would not be astounded by a light bulb. At one point, the camera moves triumphantly over the hydroelectric power plant that bears his name. This is a common refrain. Green jungle, poor villagers, intercession of a kindly outside force, hydropower. The flow of prosperity occasioned by the stopping of flow of water. CK Power, uh, their video and foregrounds Thai sites, emphasizing that its project will benefit the nation, a claim explicitly stated at the end of, of, us, of its videos. And indeed, Zyberi sends 97% of its electricity to Thailand, with the remainder going to Laos, not to, not to mention the crypto mining uh, stations on the sides of a lot of, of uh, power plants there too. If Laos to become the battery of Asia, it is one already serving its needed demands. The, this electricity is being converted into the flow of capital. And another corporate video, CK foreground solutions to environmental issues nested in technological innovation from advertising the use of its latest environmentally friendly techniques to the cool mode clock that its employees use. Endless sustainability here is a pair to endless happiness as the company's slogan. This is one possible vision of the world, one where technological intervention alters the world for the better. Straw hats and farmer shirts give way to hard hats and uniforms, where with the intercession of enlightened elites, we can have a truly endless sustainability and endless happiness. I do not mean to juxtapose a monolithic planner with a monolithic fisherman. I stood on the bank of the river with a nephew of one activist visiting Van Buk from Bangkok uh, during the Thai New Year in 2016. We took a view over the river, noting all the alterations and changes that had taken place in the river, but his vision was very much aligned with CK Powers. This is development. It's how the river will have to be, he said. You can't stop development. And indeed, why should we question it? For many, this kind of environmental activism carries with it a certain colonialist notion, a question of what nations should do with their resources. There, of course, in quotes, uh, the um, Thailand is heavily, has been for many years, uh, has a great deal of mil military intervention in politics and who actually has a say in their political organization is a question mark. For instance, in, in elsewhere in South Africa, uh, white landowners having recently had farm seized and repatriated the former owners of the land cast themselves as environmental activists, as, for, as the real guardians of the land versus their formerly colonized subjects who simply wish for their land back. In such post-colonial and nationalist renderings, the question arises, who are we, either the presumed to be neo-colonial Western observer or the presumed to be uh, uh, not invested in national development, Thai law fishermen, to deny the capital, to deny Bangkok its uh, shopping malls? It is a discourse most evident in debates about climate control. Nations newly arrived to the dubious list of carbon emitters claim they should be allowed to reap the benefits of industrialization that those long emitting carbon have. As Dr. Sankamani points out, and in nearly all the projects that I discuss here, in developers' terms, 
dams are a rational utilization of an otherwise wasted resource, resources that rightfully belong to the capital. Elizabeth Pavanelli, discussing solar power in Australia, posts, posts a salient quote, sun falls on the earth to no avail. Never mind those beings that lying outside of developer's gaze make use of it. But it is not just any earth that it falls upon. In Pavanelli's case, the sun falls upon Australian earth, its self-appropriated Aboriginal earth. Australian sunlight, by this logic, is Australia's to use, just as Mekong water and Laos or China belongs to those nations. This is a Lockean vision of the world, where human effort, where intervention, alteration, a forward motion here, creates a bond between the divine and the human right to land. Those who let sun simply be or let water simply flow are not making the most of creation and spurning the gifts the creator gives. A rational actor would make the most appropriate use of nature's bounty. There's an irony that what is being uh, the rhetoric deployed in the language of anti-imperialism now was very much the language of imperialism during the British colonial era there. This is also a uh, an idea of unilinear time projected onto the world at large, a race towards development, though I'm not unclear about what the end goal is, where nations vie for prestige. The image of a forward-looking, rational, ethical development is one that relies upon some editing behind the scenes, not to mention a conflation of the interests of urban, cosmopolitan, Thai shopping mall goers versus rural Riparian Thais. Once Decolonization is complete. It's not the fishermen who speak for the nation, but the urban cosmopolitan elite. Dakrit reveals an unfortunate stagnation of the regimes of knowledge production surrounding dam impacts, one that places decision making within state officials focused on techno scientific solutions to rural problems. State officials that further are split themselves between competing interests. Infrastructure emerges in the network of contestation and settlement between different interest groups. So CK Power's video answers these questions much as Bumi Bond's manufactured image does. Elites lead us to a different future than what we have experienced. Rhythmic notions of time, river time, give way to upwards linear development time. The villagers in the promotional videos here, whether or not that is the uh, Royal video or CK Power's video, share one common theme. They are silent. They are the recipients of expertise and knowledge and are not, as there are in many villages along, along the Mekong, including in Bambu, actively contesting or engaging with hydropower. Jerome Weddington's Anthropogenic Rivers gives a few shocking displays of, of how this construction of dependency and silencing of dissent functions. Hearing activists reports that fishermen experienced low catches after dam construction, an agency was able to identify a fisherman by name and then showed up on his doorstep with Communist Party officials in tow. The fisherman, faced with this, denied that he said anything of the sort and claimed to be misrepresented by the activists. One villager's coerced retraction was all the evidence needed for the dams to go forward. Whitington is excisive in his detail of how environmental movements come to question the assumptions behind developers' data collection, critiques do, that do not in turn lead to better processes, but rather to a creation of the unknown where progress can move forward. Why do we even ask about impacts if the answer is going to be problematic? One is reminded of Donald Trump's approach to the COVID epidemic. We would not have so many cases of illness if we did not test. So this performance of concern and patrimony masking what is actually a deep indifference is de rigueur for such projects. The denial of adverse con conditions, uh, claiming that re unannounced releases of water are water diplomacy for, thing for villages downstream, these kinds of things. The um, Chinese Ministry of Water, for instance, claims that it's uh, release and storage of water were prop were uh, I say storing water properly, reducing the discharge flow, and re and appropriately releasing the water. And here, are those statements properly, appropriately. Here is a projection of a natural system where alteration, human intervention, is in fact correct, is in fact the right thing to do. We are improving in the sense upon the ecological system via intervention. It is a correction of river time. 
Further, what releases are acknowledged are often claimed to be water diplomacy, aquatic assistance to farmers struggling with doubt downstream. In other words, dams have impacts when, they, when that is positive and none when it is negative. Let's go back to the town. In 2019, the year of those unusual dry season levels, water failed to rise at all during the monsoon. This is significant. During the monsoon, in a year when water levels received high to average levels of rainy season precipitation, water levels did not significantly alter. That water is a source of political contestation is, of course, something we know. Water is a staple of life, but to deliver it in a clean and usable way has always been the task of states. Thus, in the discourse of development, hydropower is one which reinforces hierarchical relationships in the name of assisting rural livelihoods with a moral valence, not only of civilization over ignorance, but of divine wisdom over lay profligacy. Knowledge in these models comes from the top. And resistance indicates an almost treasonous resistance to development, urbanization, modernity, what in Thai is the uh, loan word pom similar civilization. Those with status, the good people, are those best in place to decide upon the appropriate distribution of water, especially in Thailand, the monarchy. Elsewhere, I write on the magical religious quality of development discourse and the way that hierarchy and knowledge lie in tandem here. But here I want to return to that organizing question of the talk. I think I've sketched out two notions, two schematics of thinking about time and the river. The river as a resource to be placed upon a linear time managed by those with knowledge and, and based in capitals and the sort of riparian cyclical coexistence of the time. What makes up a world? What kinds of beings and relations constitute a world? What is the role of time? and rhythm here. I want to back away from two relatively simplistic arguments, the beliefs that river beings are kind of a naive metaphor for power relations or political economy, or uh, also I don't want to argue that there is a river world and a uh, developmental ontological world, each with its own assumptions without a great deal of blending. Rather, I think they're both talking about the same thing. I think they're both talking about potency and power in, their, in a kind of magical religious idiom. Mon's question to me, a genuine question about my worldview, suggests a third way, one that kind of bridges these boundaries. Worlds are always in flux. Individuals on the river think critically about what exists, what works, but also what is coming into being and what fails to work. How do we care for a new river? And how do we ensure that we are cared for by it? Well, the discourse of development has, for at least for the last century years, been a factor of the river. It is only now that it is altering the way that the river works. In the past, officials from Bangkok could promise new roads and new jobs, wars and economic structures. They could, in short, alter the human world, but remained powerless over other Dao, over the river. The same Mekong flowed past, past a royalist Laos, just as it flows past a communist one, past a paved road, a dirt road, past no road at all. But now, in the wake of such mega projects, a new order of being is underway on the river, provoking these questions. If Jackson's contribution to Thai studies is to ask us to see not the economization of the religious sphere, but rather the enchantment of the economy, here I see a similar effort in terms of the change of the Mekong. Development becomes enchanted owing to its associations with monarchy and Bangkokian sources of power, but the space vacated by the ineffectual river lords, the space of care here, that coexistence remains to be occupied. Something more remains unsaid, and individuals like Mon seek to fill that gap to answer those questions. They are not seen nor cared for by Bangkok, and now the river seems to have abandoned them as well. Do you believe what will happen? What will work? Who rules on the river? What sources of power make up the new world? How can we see them and how can we be seen by them? The powers that are currently controlling the river are careless. As, as the CK power video suggests, that they demand sil silence from fishermen and people like Mon. Indeed, when Mon spoke out about a gold mining venture in the village, he was interrogated by soldiers, but for his opposition. Environmental opposition, too, demands an alteration of the world, a movement of the river from a thing that rules itself 
that takes under its protection its own kinds of subjects towards the river as also silent, as a sub, as a resource to be protected, with displays of fealty and respect metaphorical and not actual. I argue here that Mon's question speaks for something more uh, meaningful. I have no answers to further questions that he asks, no matter how many times he asks me. Thank you. <laughs>